For centuries, Haley Gooby was written off as extinct. No recorded eruptions, no warning signs, nothing in living memory. But just 60 seconds ago, a colossal eruption tore through Ethiopia's Afar region, sending a 14-kilometer plume and an ash cloud as large as Portugal into the sky. Experts say this should not be possible. So what could trigger the impossible? And is this just the beginning? Haley Gubi sits in the heart of Ethiopia's Afar region, a landscape shaped by restless tectonic forces. For generations, this volcano was a geological footnote, its slopes weathered and its crater silent. Official records show not a single eruption in human history. Even the oldest oral traditions in the region speak of fire and smoke from other mountains. But Haley Gubi is never mentioned. Scientific catalogs list its last known activity over 12,000 years ago, predating the dawn of agriculture. That is why it earned the rare label extinct, not just dormant, but presumed dead. Its magma chambers thought to be frozen and sealed by time. Across Africa, only a handful of eruptions in the past century have approached the scale of what just unfolded here. Yet none have come from a volcano with such a blank historical record. In volcanology, the absence of eruptions for over 10,000 years is the gold standard for extinction. Haley Gooby met every criterion. No Holocene eruptions, no seismic swarms, no thermal anomalies until the past few months. The global database of volcanic activity maintained by the Smithsonian Institution listed Haley Gooby as a non-threat, a relic of the region's distant past. The scale and source made the event unexpected. This eruption has upended those assumptions. It is not just rare for an extinct volcano to awaken, it is almost unheard of. In the scientific literature, only a handful of cases worldwide have challenged the very definition of volcanic extinction. For Ethiopia and the African continent, the event stands out as one of the largest and most unexpected eruptions in living memory. The scale alone places it among the top African eruptions of the last hundred years, but the shock comes from its source, a volcano that was supposed to be as safe as stone. The question now is not just how this happened, but whether any volcano labeled extinct can ever be considered truly dormant. Ash began rising from Haley Gubby with a force that defied expectations. Within minutes, the eruption column shot upward, reaching a baseline altitude of 14 kilometers, high enough to pierce the lower stratosphere. At its most intense, pulses within the plume were measured at 16 kilometers and possibly even 20 kilometers, based on satellite and aircraft readings. This is the same altitude range as long-haul jet flight paths, where any encounter with volcanic ash can cripple engines and blind cockpit sensors. The vertical reach was only part of the story. As the column stabilized, prevailing winds caught the top of the plume and began to shear it east and north. Ash particles, some no larger than grains of flour, drifted on the jet stream and spread rapidly outward. Within hours, the cloud's footprint covered an area as large as Portugal, over 92,000 square kilometers. Satellite imagery tracked the leading edge of the ash as it crossed the Red Sea, darkening skies over Yemen and even reaching southern India. Dispersion models from the Toulouse Volcanic Ash Advisory Center confirmed the cloud's expansion, with sulfur dioxide and fine ash detected in the upper atmosphere across multiple countries. Air quality monitors reported a sudden spike in particulate matter while meteorological agencies issued advisories for regions hundreds of kilometers from the source. The sheer scale of the cloud disrupted not just local airspace, but international aviation corridors linking Africa, the Middle East, and Asia. For people on the ground, the impact was immediate. Ashfall blanketed villages and roads, turning daylight into a gray haze. In some areas, Visibility dropped to less than 30 meters as the densest part of the plume passed overhead. The region was plunged into a crisis that extended far beyond the volcano's slopes as a supposedly extinct mountain forced an entire continent to reckon with its reach. 
no alarm sounded before the ground shook. In the hours leading up to the eruption, Ethiopia's official monitoring networks registered no alerts, no warnings, and no evacuation orders for the Haley Gubi region. The volcano's extinct status had lulled both agencies and locals into a sense of security. Yet subtle signs were there. Satellite data showed an unusual white plume rising from the summit, and thermal readings hinted at something brewing beneath the surface. These signals, buried in routine data streams, went unflagged by the National Disaster Office. At 9.45 local time, a private message was sent to Ethiopia's National Disaster Risk Management Commission. The sender was an independent volcano watcher with a history of tracking remote East African eruptions. That message included real-time satellite imagery, plume analysis, and a blunt warning. Haley Gubi was showing signs of imminent activity. The bulletin was timestamped nearly two hours before the first explosion. Internal memos later cited this alert as the first credible warning received by authorities that day. Tour operators in the Afar region, responsible for guiding groups up Erta Ale's slopes, were among the first to react. Some had guests on the mountain or in nearby base camps. As news of the alert spread through informal channels, direct calls, text messages, and radio chatter, guides began moving tourists off exposed ridges and towards safer ground. Several groups reached shelter in Afdera and other villages just before the ash cloud arrived. No official evacuation had been ordered, but the personal warning had triggered a chain of decisions that likely saved lives. By the time the eruption began at 11.30, the region's communications were already jammed with urgent calls. Authorities scrambled to verify the situation, but the first public advisory did not go out until nearly 90 minutes after the initial explosion. In the end, the absence of a formal alert system was offset in part by the vigilance of one individual and the rapid response of local guides. For the tourists and workers scattered across the Afar plain, that informal network proved more reliable than any official protocol. Heat and ash swept across the Afar plain before anyone could process what was happening. At the volcano's base, the first pyroclastic flows, dense, fast-moving clouds of superheated gas and rock, raced outward, hugging the ground at terrifying speed. Satellite mapping and field reports later confirmed these flows traveled at least six kilometers from Haley Gubi summit, torching everything in their path. The landscape bore the scars, blackened brush, collapsed huts, and salt caravans forced to abandon their loads mid-route. Afar salt workers described the moment as sudden and absolute. One man, caught just beyond the main flow, recalled how the air grew thick and hot, carrying a sound like a freight train. The ground shook, the air went black, and we could not see more than a few steps, he said. We ran and covered our faces with cloths, but everyone was coughing. For villagers in settlements like Afdera, daylight vanished as ash fell in sheets, blanketing roads and roofs within minutes. Visibility dropped below 30 meters in the worst hit areas. Drivers abandoned trucks on the main road, headlights useless against the swirling gray. Livestock scattered, lost in the haze. Guides leading tourists down from Erta Ale's slopes found themselves navigating by memory unable to see the ground beneath their feet. Ash was so fine it sifted through window cracks and door frames, coating floors and bedding in a matter of hours. Some residents resorted to wrapping scarves around their faces, but even indoors, the air stung eyes and throats. Emergency calls spiked for breathing problems and minor injuries from falling debris. No official evacuation order reached these communities before the ash arrived. Instead, people relied on word of mouth and instinct heading for low ground seeking shelter in concrete buildings or huddling behind walls. The speed and scale of the eruption left little time for organized response. In the chaos, stories spread of entire salt caravans vanishing into the gloom, only to reappear hours later, shaken, but alive. For those on the ground, the threat was not just the eruption itself, but the suffocating, disorienting world it created in its wake.
In July 2025, satellites began to register subtle but unmistakable changes along the Erta Ale volcanic range. The UK's Comet project released INSAR deformation maps showing a band of ground uplift stretching southeast from Erta Ale's caldera toward Haley Gooby, an anomaly that would soon take on global significance. The data revealed a shallow dipping dike nearly 40 kilometers long slicing through the crust at depths of 2 to 5 kilometers. This was not a random pulse of movement. The intrusion followed the tectonic grain of the rift, with its strike running north-northwest to south-southeast, precisely in line with the region's most active faults. As the days passed, the pattern grew clearer. Sentinel-1 and Cosmos SkyMed satellites captured a trough of deformation land surface shifting by centimeters, connecting the two volcanoes. The thickness of the dike, modeled at up to five meters in places, suggested a significant volume of magma was on the move. By mid-July, ground-based seismic networks started to pick up a swarm of small earthquakes along the same corridor. The quakes migrated steadily toward Haley Gooby, shallow at first, then clustering at depths of three to six kilometers beneath the volcano's base. Some of the deepest tremors, recorded at up to 30 kilometers below the surface, hinted, each hinted at input from the lower crust or even the mantle. Field teams working with satellite guidance mapped fresh fissures and minor surface ruptures south of Erta Ailes caldera. New cracks appeared in the ground and faint plumes of gas rose from vents that had been silent for decades. Along the projected path of the dike, thermal satellite imagery picked up scattered hotspots, evidence of heat breaking through at the surface. By late summer, Haley Gubby itself began to show signs of unrest, localized uplift at the summit, a persistent white plume, and new ground cracks visible in high-resolution imagery. The Comet data products, now central to the investigation, allowed scientists to reconstruct the journey of magma across the rift. This was not a simple vertical ascent, but a lateral intrusion, magma traveling underground for nearly 40 kilometers before reaching a volcano that had been considered extinct. The evidence for this underground connection, drawn from a blend of satellite deformation, seismic mapping, and field observation, has redefined the understanding of how rift volcanoes interact. It was this hidden migration, invisible to the naked eye, that set the stage for Haley Gooby's explosive awakening. Inside Haley Gooby, the eruption's violence was primed by a process both subtle and powerful, an interaction between two very different magmas. Satellite and geodetic data point to a months-long buildup beneath the volcano. Beginning in July 2025, when magma from the Erta Ailey system began migrating southeast, this incoming melt was hot, low in silica, and highly mobile, a basaltic magma capable of moving quickly through the crust. Beneath Haley Gooby, however, the geology told a different story. The ancient magma chamber, untouched for millennia, likely held a thicker, cooler, more silica-rich trachyte. When the new basaltic magma entered this chamber, it did not simply pool quietly. Instead, it mixed with the resident trachyte, setting off a chain of chemical and physical reactions. Laboratory studies on other rift volcanoes show that when these two types of magma meet, the result is more than just a blend. The mixing process can dramatically lower the viscosity of the magma body, making it much easier for gas bubbles to form and grow. Think of it like stirring hot water into thick syrup. The mixture suddenly flows more freely, and trapped gases can escape with explosive force. Over the next four and a half months, pressure built steadily inside Haley Gubby. The combined magma, now less viscous and more volatile rich, became primed for a rapid ascent. With each passing week, the risk of an eruption increased. Though the volcano's surface gave little away beyond subtle ground swelling and faint plumes, petrographic textures from similar eruptions elsewhere reveal mingling bands, zoned crystals, and glassy shards, signs of magma mixing and disequilibrium. 
although field teams have yet to recover fresh samples from Haley Gooby's November eruption. The observed explosivity and ash composition suggest that a similar process unfolded here. Experimental work supports the idea. When basaltic magma injects into a trachytic chamber, the sudden drop in viscosity can trigger runaway bubble growth and rapid degassing. In Haley Gooby's case, the set the BDT. This set the stage for an eruption far more violent than anything the volcano's ancient slopes had seen before. The four and a half months of pressurization, invisible but relentless, was the chemical trigger that turned a silent relic into one of Africa's most explosive volcanoes. Quantifying the scale of Haley Gooby's eruption begins with the Volcanic Explosivity Index, or VEI, a global standard for comparing eruptions. Scientists rely on a chain of evidence, how high the ash plume rose, how much material was ejected, and the mass of volcanic gases released into the atmosphere. For Haley Gooby, the numbers are striking. Satellite instruments measured between 305,000 and 350,000 tons of sulfur dioxide injected into the lower stratosphere. This is several times higher than most African eruptions in recent memory. Meanwhile, preliminary mapping of the ash blanket suggests a tephra volume between 0.09 and 0.13 cubic kilometers, enough to blanket an area larger than Portugal in fine volcanic debris. Plume heights reached up to 16 kilometers, with sustained columns above 13 kilometers for more than 15 hours. These metrics fit the criteria for a high-end VEI-3, or more likely, a low-end VEI-4 event. International agencies, including the Smithsonian, VAAC Toulouse, and the United Kingdom's Comet Project, have provisionally classified the eruption as VEI-4, pending final ground surveys. This places Haley Gooby among the most powerful eruptions on the African continent in a century, not just for its violence, but for the sheer volume of gas and ash it hurled into the sky. Forecast models from global monitoring agencies suggest the eruption at Haley Gooby may be far from over. Rift volcanoes are known for unpredictable behavior, and with magma still present beneath the surface, the risk of renewed activity remains high. International teams, including the United Kingdom's Comet Project and the Toulouse Volcanic Ash Advisory Center, continue to track satellite signals for signs of ground deformation and new gas emissions. The initial explosive phase may have ended, but low-level degassing and intermittent ash bursts could persist for weeks or even months. In similar rift settings, eruptions have shifted from explosive to effusive, producing lava flows long after the main blast. Authorities have deployed additional sensors and are urging both locals and visitors to remain vigilant. Ashfall continues to disrupt daily life in villages up to 28 kilometers from the crater, with secondary hazards like mud flows possible if rains arrive. The absence of a clear historical pattern at Haley Gubby means that every new signal matters. Until real-time data confirm the system is fully dormant, the region will stay under close watch. For now, scientists and emergency managers are treating the volcano as an active threat, ready to respond if the situation escalates again. Today, the line between extinct and active is thinner than we thought. Over 800 million people live near volcanoes worldwide, many labeled dormant, and some even called dead. Haley Gooby reminds us that geology does not follow calendars or names. As data pours in, vigilance, not complacency, shapes survival. Nature's timelines are still being written. Stay curious, stay aware, and share your thoughts below.